Hello. All right, we are live. I am just going to get everything set up. Give folks just a minute. Um, hope everybody's having a good morning. I am having an interesting morning. Um, a seven-year-old made fun of my outfit this morning. Oh, that's how that's how I'm doing. That's how my morning has gone so far. She looked at me and she was like, <laughs> she's like, oh my gosh, your outfit is slay. And I was wearing sweatpants and one of Dom's shirts. <laughs> and I was like, I know you're making fun of me. Um, and I was like, these are my pajamas, you know, and I was telling her and she was like, it's slay. <laughs> I was like, mm, you're lying. <laughs> so anyway, hope you didn't get made fun of by a seven-year-old this morning. But if you did, then maybe you think you're in good company. I don't know. <laughs> good morning, everybody. All right. So we're going to get started here in just a minute. Um, today, we're going to be talking about why it's important to stop comparing yourself to other creators, other community builders, and why you don't need a thousand, two thousand, however many thousands of community builder or community members in order for your community to be successful. Hey, Jabbar, um, that's not what you need. So we're going to talk about what you do need instead. And we're going to talk about some examples kind of in aggregate of some of the types of clients we work with um, who are very successful, financially successful, and otherwise who don't have a thousand members and who don't need them in order to be successful. And in fact, having a community that large would actually take away from some of the experience from some folks. It's not to say you can't scale a community, but it's a topic for another day. All right. So hi, everybody. I am Carrie Melissa Jones. If you don't know me yet, I am a community builder, strategist, strategist, social scientist, and entrepreneur. And I help organizations of all shapes and sizes to invest in incredibly meaningful communities that drive business impact. So I'm excited to be sharing some of our learnings from the last few months with you and the last few years actually with you alongside the research that we do as well. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. If this is interesting to you, if this is a topic you want to dive into further, I highly, highly recommend checking out our workshop that we just released. It's all about how to create a thriving community, the one that maybe you have been dreaming about for months or years even. You can find that in the video description below this live or in the recording of this live um, so that you can really dive even deeper into everything we're going to talk about today. Um, we share a structure for these six different pieces of a framework that you need to have in place for a community to be, to really feel successful and to really feel thriving. And so get that, <laughs> if, that's, uh, if that is not already on your radar. Um, yes, Jamar said, I can't imagine having a thousand members with the kind of community I have. Yeah. Well, I can from like a perspective of like, I could see you growing that large, but um, how you, uh, let's make sure my internet, my internet might be being a little wonky, how you build that community, how you nurture those community members is very different at the 1000 number versus at, um, you know, at even a hundred or 10, 20, it's, it's very different. Um, it's possible to do it with a thousand members, but you do not need 1000 members for your community to be really thriving and successful. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to be diving into today. Um, so let's begin with um, what I'm going to talk about are three different models that I have seen be really successful that again, your community does not have to be large in order to be financially successful. So I'm going to walk you through these three different models that you can explore for your own community and, um, and to help you pursue whatever phase of your community you're ready to enter into next. So the first example or the first structure that I want to talk you through is a community that's really built around more of a high ticket kind of program. This is what coaches will typically call like a high ticket signature program or something like this, where the program might cost $1,000, $2,000 US dollars. If you're um, from somewhere else, that's the currency I'm talking about right now. Um, and in that way, you're able to build a financially sustainable business and have still a small community. You know, you don't need a thousand members paying uh, $3,000, $5,000 per year in order to have a sustainable business model. So it doesn't even have to, you don't have to charge that much in order for this to be successful. But I just want you to understand that that's how this can look. Now, what I see, I'm thinking right now about one specific entrepreneur community. It's, it's a community for female entrepreneurs who are um, really ambitious and want to take their businesses to the next level. And this community is able to be so successful because they have dozens and dozens of members 
but because they have worked up their pricing over time, starting at about $200 per year, moving up now to, I'm a member of this community to this day, I pay about 10X that. <laughs> um, and folks who join at that lower rate are grandfathered into that rate. So you can still have a growing community and not everybody has to be paying that really high ticket price. If some people got in earlier, um, they can stay in at that price point. And what I hear from other members of that community who I've spoken to and done research on is that a lot of them feel like I would never leave this community because I don't want to have to pay the, the current pricing structure, but it's still very, very valuable to me just that my business doesn't support me to do, you know, like a $5,000 a month pricing structure. I'm oh, sorry, $5,000 a year pricing structure. I can't invest in that for myself. So in that way, the the creator of this community is able to support even those who are not as, um, who are not able to pay that higher price point, but who got in earlier. And she's able to also extend scholarships and others, uh, other ways of getting people in at a lower price point. But that way she's able to then create, she's got this solid group of folks who are already participating. And then she's able to grow on top of that at a higher price point every single year. So that is one way to think about this is that as you are bringing in more and more folks, it's not that they all have to be paying the exact same amount in your community. So in that way, you don't have to create something that is excluding people based on their financial means. That's what we do not want to create. Um, one of our values at the CMJ group is equity. And so we want to make sure that there are always avenues and pathways for us and for the clients that we work with to get into a community that's going to change their lives and make their businesses thrive and have all these other incredible outcomes. We want to make sure there's pathways, even for those who might not have the financial means to otherwise get into the community. But for you as a business owner, you've got to run the numbers and understand, okay, well, I can't only charge $97 a year for my membership forever, because then I would have to have thousands of members in order to make this work. But if you're charging a higher price point, then you can have fewer people higher quality um, engagement happening in there because when people put, they make that financial investment, it does make a huge difference to the amount that they engage. Um, I have run both low ticket and high ticket programs for myself and my clients. And I just find that the caliber of folks in terms of um, their their um, investment in the community is much, much higher because they have put some skin in the game um, and sometimes some significant skin in the game. Um, now, let me caveat all of this. Hey, Will, um, let me caveat all of this by saying like th the plan here is not just for you to like keep raising the price and like then you get a higher quality of person to join. Like absolutely not. I don't want you to take that away from this. <laughs> okay. Um, because again, this is about equity, but it's really about what is a meaningful amount of skin in the game so that the people that join your community are really, really going to be dedicated and ready to make this contribution financially and then contribution back into their business, back into the progress they want to make. So that's what um, this this community of entrepreneurs is able to do is that when members are joining at this higher price point, they say, okay, I'm really going to make sure that I get something out of this every single month that I'm a member. I'm going to participate in the roundtables that happen. I'm going to submit to these. There's different awards and things you can get inside of the community. So that is one model you can pursue. And again, you don't need thousands of members paying thousands of dollars every year. You just need a handful really to have a successful foundation for your business. So I'm curious if this is something that you've been experimenting with, if pricing is an experimental consideration for you in your community, if it's something that you are changing and experimenting with and kind of rising over time. This is something I see a lot um, in the membership community building clients that I work with. And I think it's a really solid way to begin is to start out at a price point that will not freak everybody out. <laughs> um, this is not 2020 anymore. So we can't just like go out there and there were just so many coaches charging like astronomical sums of money for these really meh programs, really mid programs. And uh, that we just can't do that anymore. So we've got to start <laughs> someplace and then build it up over time. So uh, let me know if you're experimenting with pricing and what you've been learning through that process so far. All right. The second structure that I want to talk through is really building upon that, which is not starting out with this high ticket program or even a plan to create a high ticket program off of what you're building, but starting off just knowing that what you're creating will be small for a while. 
and just reminding yourself that this just like investing, this is a metaphor I use a lot. It's just like when you're investing your money in mutual funds or in the stock market. Um, any most financial planners, advisors will tell you, you need to give it lots of time. Time is on your side in terms of investing. So over time, the amount you save compounds on itself and it just grows so that, you know, putting in $500 a month might seem like to some people, it might seem impossible to other people. It might seem like a drop in the bucket. Over time, that compounds. Putting even even five dollars in a month can compound over time, so that you get you know ten thousand dollars over the next ten to twenty years. So this is the same thing with communities, and that if you invest really diligently and consistently in a small group to begin with, that it starts to compound over time. You get natural word of mouth. People say, "Oh my gosh, I've been part of this community for several months. It's changed the way that I do my business." And just continuing to know that these things will grow naturally over time. That creates this sense of relaxation. Like you can chill out, <laughs> you can just chill out. And I see a lot of creators. This is, I would say this is the bulk of the creators and the entrepreneurs that I work with. They come in with this anxiety thinking like, oh my gosh, I've seen all these, you know, all these other communities that have thousands of members and they feel really anxious and they're comparing themselves to them. And then the big shift that I see in them is like, oh my gosh, I can relax. Like it's going to take me a couple of years to get there. It's going to take me a couple of years. And the longer I wait, the longer it's going to take me to get those couple of years under my belt and to get this um, work under my belt and to get this scale, to get this scaled up. So I see a lot of communities out there. This is a, it's something to just hold and be really cautious about. There's so many communities out there, including like smart passive income. I think it's Pat Flynn is the one that runs that creator science, creator wizard. They're all like these creator communities. And it's no surprise to me, it's no shock to me that these uh, communities are all, that these memberships are all memberships teaching you how to sell memberships. <laughs> um, and they're really focused on like getting you to your revenue goals and all of that. And they tout these thousands and thousands of members. Well, they're really selling pickaxes to miners in these scenarios. So you just want to be really cautious. Like that's not what success is. And like, good for them that they've been able to do this. Um, but that's not how most communities look and work. Um, so just, I want you to hold that in mind that you don't have to compare yourselves to them or to anybody else in your niche. Just know and have faith that, that things keep building over time. And it just takes patience and time and really investing in relationships and trust. If you do that over time and you're really diligent about it and you are consistent about how you show up for people and the value that you bring to them, your membership will grow. So you don't have to have 1,000 people. You can have 10, okay, just to begin with. Um, yes, and Jamar said, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, as Will said, larger communities um, sometimes bring larger headaches. You should definitely nail before you scale. Yeah, I love that. Nail it before you scale it. I like that. <laughs> I like that saying, Will, you should take that, <laughs> take that and use it somewhere <laughs> besides just this YouTube chat. Um, yes, absolutely. Like there's going to be so many things that you need to figure out in your membership or your community before you start to grow to a thousand. So starting with these 10 people and really being really intentional about the folks that you're bringing in from the very beginning um, and the kind of interactions that you're having with them, that is what's going to help set you up for success. What you see in a lot of these communities with thousands of members is that they have a leaky bucket. Like there's people coming in, circulating, and then leaving over time. And so, um, Oh, nice. <laughs> you have used that saying before, Will. Um, so yeah, that's what ends up happening. So those problems with scale will be major, major problems if you don't fig figure out um, the issues that are creating that leaky bucket to begin with. So that's the second kind of thing. The second kind of structure you can think through for your community is just having this faith that over several years, this is going to build up over time and it will. Um, the third framework that I, or structure that I want to kind of talk through is running a community. And this is something that I think a lot of people are doing organically, but not really doing strategically is running communities as more like time bound programs. So you'll see this a lot in cohort based workshops or cohort based, um, uh, courses that might be happening or programs that are run. I was just listening to a podcast, um, with, I think it's the 
the community is called Retail Ready, I believe. Um, Ali Ball is the creator of it. And they used to run a cohort model. We used to actually run a cohort model and do this. Um, what is What can be really successful about running a cohort model and running a timed community program is that you're creating what in community building is called shared experiences, which is just obvious. <laughs> it's like we're doing the same thing at the same time. We're going through this together. We're creating lasting memories uh, together. And, uh, you know, you're creating something that everybody is going through at the same time. That is an extremely bonding thing to do. Not everybody that signs up will be bonded in this way, but going through this together will create a sense of community. Um, shared experiences are an important component to this four piece sense of community that I will not get into today. Um, but that is one of the key components. So what is powerful about this is that people often join communities, not for the community itself, but for the content and for the actually what they're going to get out of it. So the what's in it for me, but they find that once they had joined for the actual program itself, for this time shared experience, that they find that they actually want to stick around because they met some incredible people in that community. So you can start out with a cohort model and then you can build that up over time and actually, you know, run several cohorts and then invite people in to be part of something more ongoing. Say like, hey, let's meet back up again. Let's have alumni meetups. Let's have gatherings in a shared space. Um, and this can be a really effective sales technique because it creates urgency because you're running timed programs. And um, this is the big challenge with running always open evergreen communities is that there's no urgency for anyone to join. So if you create time to programs, then you're creating that urgency. Also, you're able to generally, this is so silly. And one of the most frustrating things about my job <laughs> is that people are willing to spend more on a workshop or a specific um, educational outcome than they are on access to an always on community. They just are. They're more willing to spend more money because I think it's really because it's tangible. What they're able to get out of it is really, really tangible. And so you can usually charge a higher, uh, you can usually charge at a higher price point for a timed program or a cohort program than you can for an always on community because you're able to say, here's exactly what you're going to get out of it. Here are the deliverables that you'll create. Here are the things that you will learn. Here's how your business or your life will change. And then you'll be done. And that's actually when we're making the decision to spend money on something that can be easier to wrap our heads around than you're going to get access to this always on community. You'll have a group of friends who you didn't have before. And like nobody's generally, especially if we're talking about like creators and entrepreneurs, like people aren't generally looking just to make friends for the sake of making friends. You know, some of us are like me. <laughs> I'm always looking to make friends, but, but most people are not. And I've done a lot of research on this. So just take my word for it. Okay. So that's why I want to really emphasize that this is a great way to get started with your community because it creates that urgency. You can charge more for it. You can build those relationships. And then over time, you can start to build something that is evergreen for those folks who you have gathered. And you'll also find that it's easier to sell future programs to folks who are happy with the past programs that you've run. So your sale becomes much, much easier because you're not just trying to convert new people all the time. You're actually trying to um, convert already, people who are already loyal and happy and who like you. <laughs> so that's much, much easier to do. Um, so these are just some of the three structures. I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions. Um, yes, Jamar said uh, he's been, Jamar is, is in the CMJ community. He's been doing member interviews. This is one of the things that's really important to do a step back after you've been running your community for a little bit or before you've launched. And um, he's been doing that. He's been interviewing members of his community and he's learning that they came for the learning, but stayed for the community. Yeah, this is really, really, really common. So that's why it's such a powerful way of selling your community membership to begin with. Um, and then let's see, Sarah. Yeah, you could do time programs that evolve into a community. Exactly. Um, a question from Sarah. So how do you keep people engaged after the cohort based training? I have a lot of engagement in my cohort focused community during the event and then a big fall off when the event wraps up. Yeah, that's very, very, very normal. There's a couple of things that I will share here. One is we have a philosophy that I share in the CMJ community, which is this concept of having a quiet community. Like it's okay for things to fall off for a little while. It's okay for things to be quiet. We don't want to be distracting folks from the actual progress that they want to be making in their businesses and their lives when we're running communities. So that's one thing I would just like 
put yourself at ease that you don't have to always have engagement be super, super high in order to have a successful community. It can be quiet and really strategic and intentional. And you can have like weeks where very little is even happening in your community. So that's the first thing I'll say. But the second thing is that, yes, it will get quiet. And if you want to keep that going over the long term, then the way that you invest in it is different. The way that you show up as a leader is different because you're usually when you're running these timed programs, you're like heavily, you're in there all day uh, during those time programs. You're like, you've got to open on your screen. You're like, I'm here to answer questions. And then afterwards, you're just like, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. <laughs> I'm so exhausted. I just want to break from everything. And so how you show up as a leader needs to be a little bit different because you've got to manage your energy differently. So when you shift from the timed program into ongoing engagement, one of the things that's really important to do is to say, okay, I'm going to spend two to three hours maximum, maximum per week in my community. And during those two to three hours, that's going to be time that I respond to anything that anyone's posted, but likely it's very quiet. So nobody's posting anything. So instead I'm going to spend those two to three hours thinking about what's something I can do to like what's a resource I can share this week? What's, um, maybe I can run like an off cycle, um, you know, just office hour or something like this, uh, and have that be planned for one week. Maybe I can bring in an expert or maybe bring in a student who was part of that past cohort. I can have them come in and do a talk. So it's about keeping there being some touch points, even between cohort programs. So that way you can keep them in the community. You don't have to remove them. They can remove themselves if they don't want to be part of it anymore. That's always welcome. That's always welcome in, in our space that we've created. Um, but if they want to stay engaged, if they want to keep having these touch points, they want to keep making progress, even between cohorts, you can still be doing things um, together with them. So that's what I would say. And then as you do that, what you'll notice is you're creating these more, more of these touch points Then people will think of your community more when they have a question about something. They'll say like, Oh, I remember like Sarah's community. It's actually a place I can go to ask about OKRs or my goals. I don't have to just sit in <laughs> alone at my desk. Um, I remember that I have this resource. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful that I have it. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the ways that you can like really balance your energy on that. And then over time, you can step back a little bit more from planning um, to do more of like planned programs and then just step back and be responding to people's questions, uh, be encouraging their engagement, be pinging people. When you see somebody's question come in, what I always recommend is reaching out to other people who you know you who will have good answers to their questions and then um, talking to them and saying like, hey, this thread just got posted. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I'm sure that so-and-so would also love to hear your answers. And that way you're just bringing people in. The more touch points you can create, the more it will be top of mind for folks and the more um, engagement you will be able to sustain over time. Um, yes, all right. Um, yeah, you. Yeah, and Sarah, you just mentioned like, it's it's just figuring out how to reactivate folks. Yeah, so, I mean, I would love to talk to you about this, like just personally and like how you can get over this hump of like, things have kind of died down. How do we reactivate? Because there's definitely a strategy that you could employ here. Um, and I think you might be, I think you might have a circle community. So like it's, people are going to have notifications turned on at least a portion of them. So it actually should be fairly low touch, low lift um, in, in Jamar's uh, terminology to, to get them reactivated. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, as Will said, it's best to learn and grow with your community. This is even when things seem slow or quiet. That's what I'm learning. Yeah. And go with the flow with them too. Like what I'm finding is right now, our community is a little bit quiet in this particular season, which is surprising to me because a lot of times communities will slow down a lot in the summer. Ours didn't really in the summer. Our summer was like pretty busy. And now in fall, I think a lot of people are tired because they didn't slow down in the summer. <laughs> and I'm just kind of feeling like energetically that people are kind of wanting a little bit more quiet. Um, and so what we're doing about that is embracing it, but also we're planning some, we're being really careful about what we plan. We're planning a workshop series in October, um, later on this month, um, and planning some like reflective end of year exercises and things like that for December. Cause December is just like a wash in most communities, depending on what kind of community you run. But, um, most that I look at that, that is the case. Um, and Will, you said, I'm in the midst of bringing back a dying community and I've been able to connect more with members and understand wants needs better because of the slowness. Oh, really interesting. 
Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. You mentioned that the direct one-to-one -one times that you're having, if things are slow, one reactivation strategy, and this is, this could be really helpful for you, Sarah, um, is actually what Jamar is doing. And you'll find this in the Engage Your Online Community course inside of the CMJ community is starting to do your interviews. So instead of just like going out and like throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall, which can sometimes feel really good <laughs> in the moment, or you're just like, okay, at least I'm doing something. Um, actually just take this time where things are slow and where you just have this, you're like, I'm ready to reinvest in this, but I want to make sure I'm doing it in a really strategic and intentional way. This could be a great time for you now to step back and have one-on-one -on -one calls with your members and say like, Hey, I'm just checking in with you. Like, how did you enjoy our program? What, what are you working on now? You know, how might you be served by a community around what you're working on now? And just get back with them and talk to them, catch back up with them again. Um, that can be a really, really, um, uh, helpful exercise to to do right now. Um, okay. Oh, as Sarah said, I honestly don't see this kind of perspective elsewhere in the community conversation. So I really appreciate the point of view. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> and it really frustrates me. Um, there's a lot of people out there touting like build your dream community. And again, like they're selling pickaxes to miners. Um, and so like, I, I'm not here to just like, tell you all the ways that you can make a million dollars off of your community. Like, yes, you can make a million dollars off of your community and let's like run the numbers on it. I have a spreadsheet actually I'm working on right now um, to share in the CMJ community of projections for revenue projections. So if you have like different tiers of pricing, how to um, project your revenue and you need to make sure that you're accounting for um, churn when you're doing that. So the challenging thing about communities, especially evergreen and month to month communities is that every month that you're growing, you're also like dropping some. And sometimes you'll have negative months where you're actually like, losing, not losing money, but um, you're losing more members than you're gaining. And uh, you just have to project for that and plan for it. But anyway, that's a resource that I'm going to be sharing in the community pretty soon. Um, and so you will get that. Um, uh, Sarah, I feel bad asking questions that are 100% know are answered in your community. I need time to really get started in there. Yes, do not feel bad about that at all. Um, that is part of the job of teaching, frankly, is like repeating yourself a bunch of times because uh, people learn in different ways. You might learn better by watching me on a live than you would if you were to like click through a um, asynchronous course. And I welcome that. I welcome that very much. And I love this work and I will answer your question a hundred times if that's what you need in order to uh, move yourself forward. Um, yeah, truly, I love talking about this stuff. All right. Um, great conversation in the chat. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. As I mentioned, there is um, a free workshop, which you can grab in the um, description, the video description for this live. And you can grab that. It's going to have the six pieces of the framework that you need to create a really strategic and intentional community, to create one that is thriving, that you feel really excited about. And it's brand new content, totally updated. And uh, we just released it about a month ago. So I'm excited to hear your feedback and your thoughts. Um, let me know what you have learned from today beyond what's in the chat here. If you're watching the recording of this, let me know um, from the recording what you've learned today, what you're gonna apply, what structure you're really thinking about for your community and um, how I can help you move forward. Okay, friends, I'm gonna log out now. Um, and uh, yeah, I will see you on the internet. Find me on Instagram and I will be back next week. We're going to talk actually next week. I'm really excited about it because I'm going to do um, like a reaction video and <laughs> I've not let myself look at, I'm going to be reviewing two, maybe three different communities um, that are publicly available on the internet. And I'm going to do like a live reaction video to them so that you can see like what it looks like when I am reviewing a community. I go in and I audit a lot of different communities for enterprises, for small businesses. And so I'm going to do it live and I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> it's going to be like, you know, one of these like music reaction videos, maybe. Um, although maybe I'm less, I, I think it'll probably be interesting for those of you who are here today. This is like your jam, maybe not for somebody who's not into this. <laughs> um, it's very niche. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. And uh, yeah, we're going to be reviewing, I think, the Monday community and uh, the Airtable community. And there's one more that I was thinking about doing. Um, that I'll surprise you with <laughs> next week. <laughs> okay, friends, have a beautiful rest of your day and I will see you on the internet. Bye.